So the thing is, when we think about what it means that first part of the equation, variability, the big thing for you to think about here is it's not just like, you can call me ADHD. I mean, heavens knows my mom will agree with you. And you know, so will just about anybody that knows me, that's fine. But it's deeper than that. We're just all really, really different in almost every dimension possible, okay? So we're a mix of a bunch of boring and interesting variability, okay? So that's the first one, the part you probably knew. But the part you may not know, or know how much it matters, is that second part, context, okay? Context matters, and it matters in a lot of different ways. For the sake of time, I'll say, if you wanna know more, if you go to like my faculty website, there's a bunch of stuff on this, but from a science perspective, there's no such thing as you having knowledge. Like we treat it as if you know a certain amount that you put in a container, or, you, or we give you a number for an, your intelligence. It's just so stupid, right? We know absolutely for sure from the learning sciences that we can vary what you know based on what we do in the context. We can change that, okay? So there's some serious problems coming forward with standardized tests and intelligence tests that they, they've seen their last days, I promise you. But, and just, but what's really cool about context is it matters in such a fundamental way, okay? So let's go back to my interesting variability, not the impulsivity, because that just makes me sad, but the novelty seeking. That idea that I can't stand boredom. Now, to please tell me, anybody else here with me on that? Okay, yeah, thank you. I mean really can't stand it. And again, we have this term novelty seeking. What it really means is that my brain actually enjoys unpredictable environments. Some people can't stand it. They need the routine. I hate routine. I loathe it, okay? And it's not just a preference. It's not like I like strawberry ice cream and by the way, I like novelty, right? It goes all the way down to genetic differences. In fact, I took the test. I've got a little genetic variance called DRD4 gene that predisposes me to like novelty, okay? Like planes and stuff like that. But, um, so what? So what does that mean? Like, what, what is me having a, an increased uh, penchant for novelty? What does that mean for my life? And if you think of the outcome as variability equals outcome, it doesn't seem very good. <laughs> but I want to say, when we look at the science of this, it turns out there's two very, very, very different paths that novelty seeking takes. They're so different that we call them the dark side of novelty seeking and the bright side, okay? You're probably familiar, if you have any, know anything about ADHD, you're probably really familiar with the dark side of novelty seeking, okay? There's this research that's good research that says, oh my goodness, my little difference in novelty seeking suggests that I am more likely to drop out of school, okay, check. Um, I'm likely to end up in jail, but that was just kind of lucky that didn't happen. Um, I could be uh, likely for drug addiction, alcoholism, um, make less money in life, generally less happy. That's a path. It's the dark side of novelty seeking. It's a real path. And it's one you may be familiar with. Yep. In the scientific research, there's a second path that has every bit as much research behind it. For 100 years, we've known that that same novelty seeking <clears throat> is one of two components of curiosity. And curiosity is one of the single best predictors of almost everything you care about. It's one of the best predictors of how well you'll do in school, how much money you'll make, how happy you'll be in life. And it's coming from the exact same Genetic difference. These two paths are about as opposite as you could possibly have them. And the two areas of research, they, they rarely talk. One is the medical model of disease, that thing of they're trying to look for the bad stuff that can happen and trying to stop it. The other is what they call like positive psychology. They, they don't talk, they don't even, they, they really despise each other quite a bit. But, um, but they bicker a little bit about who's right. But the reality is, they're both right. 
Those are both real paths and they can happen. But if I'm sitting here right now, and if you're like me and you have that little difference, I don't really care about the arguing of who's right. I, I think the better question is what makes the difference? And it turns out we actually have quite a bit of knowledge about what makes the difference from the research. And you may not be surprised given that I've made you know an equation. It's context. And one of the big things in context, and meaning context is to everything around you, besides you, in the research, one of the best predictors of which way this goes is as simple as this. Do the important context of your life value curiosity? And that seems almost too simple to be true, but the research is there, okay? So let me tell you what I mean by value curiosity. The important ones, let's start with school. And it's kind of funny because at first you think, well, what school wouldn't value curiosity? Well, just ask the kids, okay? Um, because curiosity can be kind of annoying sometimes, you know? And they ask questions you'd never thought of and really would rather not have to answer. Most schools would say, of course we value curiosity. Look at our mission statement, right? And if you ever spent any time in the school, the day in, day out stuff in the classroom is almost the exact opposite. And I want to get, I want to tell you a story. So part of my work at uh, this nonprofit CAST, which is just a phenomenal group of people, I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of, a uh, small part of what, of what that organization does, is we were creating digital, um, we do digital learning environments that are really flexible. And in this case, we had created a science notebook, a digital one, that had all the supports you could possibly need. Everything could be read to you. I mean, anything, any difference, it, it will account for. Okay, because we want to know what you know about science, not whether you can read right now, that kind of thing. We're piloting this uh, browser-based uh, science notebook with third graders, okay? We get into the classroom, we've got their computers set up, they're gonna learn about magnets, which once we saw the magnets next to the laptops, we thought, <laughs> that's probably not a good idea, but um, we learned. And we're, we get in the class, and it's a great class, these little kids, now, as they, you've already heard of them, I was introduced, I tend to be on the ADHD side of things, okay? So most kids are not hyperactive to me. Like, I've rarely met anyone where I'm like, okay, dude, you know. In this class, there's this kid that I was like, that kid's ADHD. And I was like, dude, you gotta settle down, man. So right before we're gonna bring them to their laptops to, to do their inquiry science, the teacher sits them down in, in the, on the carpet and says, let me tell you about science and inquiry. And the kids are getting jazzed. And she's like, the most important thing is scientists love mistakes. That's the only way you learn. I was like, this is good. I like this, you know? I'm, I'm liking what she's saying. And he's like, you, you, you take guesses and then you test it. And when you're wrong, which is scientists are almost always wrong, you know, you learn from it and you go on. Isn't that great? And the kids are like, yeah. And they go to their laptops, and they've got our, our, our prototype of the science notebook open on their browser, and they're doing their magnets. Well, my little friend, the hyperactive kid, he clicks on the back button of the browser, okay? Technically, you're not supposed to do that, and technically, we did say you're not supposed to do that, but the whole system crashed. Like, everything just crashed. And now, first of all, this was a prototype, so we're really happy that he did that because you don't have to send it out to a bunch of schools and realize as soon as someone hits the back button on a browser, nobody gets to use it. But my goodness, you would have thought this kid had shot the teacher's dog, right? <laughs> they rained holy hell down on him, like, look what you did. And I was like, hold on. We're really happy for this. We need that, right? They're called bugs, you know? And it kind of, I started realizing this poor kid, we just set him up, right? Because we told him mistakes were good. We told him inquiry science was good. What we didn't tell him was we meant inquiry science in the browser, right? <laughs> mistakes are good in the browser. Outside, you'll get punished, right? But like, I have this hunch that that kind of thing happens more often than not in classrooms. And I'm not going to say that every school has to value curiosity but at least you can't be a hypocrite, right? Don't say you do, 
in your mission statement and then everything about your school is the exact opposite because it really doesn't allow parents to be able to say that my kid my kid has novelty seeking thing and he's going to be in big trouble if you put this kid in a class in a school that doesn't value it okay so does your context value the curiosity so you go to another important context home home life <coughs> bless you um that's how you interact with the audience just so you know as i'm speaking to engage the audience um you might think as a parent like well, wait a minute who wouldn't value curiosity at home right well there are some parents i doubt any of them are here um just a hunch too but even parents who their instinct is to think wow curiosity would be great i think that you can lead yourself to making decisions about parenting that are actually counterproductive if you've only been told the first half of this equation. If you, and in particular, you've only been told that there's one path for this novelty seeking to take. Because then any time a kid is like anything like novelty seeking or curiosity, you see it as a step toward uh, prison. Like what's our friend here that was gonna go to prison, right? But we will visit you, I promise. Yeah. Tim. But everything that happens that looks anything like novelty seeking is like, whoa, okay, hold on. You know? And in fact, if you go look at some of the, the parenting guides for ADHD, when it gets to novelty seeking, what do they tell you? Don't reward it, first of all. And then it's like, basically strip your home life of anything interesting. Routine, routine, routine. Now, I don't mean to say that routine's not important that structure is not important, but structure is not the same thing as being rigid. Yeah, you should learn to scrub your teeth at the same time every night, that's great. But when you strip the home life of anything constructive for that novelty seeking to come out through, you're almost enabling the thing you're trying to stop from happening. So when you realize that one of the best things you can do, both at school and at home, is genuinely respect the curiosity, but try to shape the behavior. Because it's great that they're gonna ask questions you don't wanna hear. And you could say, well, that was a really good question, Tim. But uh, maybe you don't wanna call out the pastor in the middle of church, right? Something, you can shape the behavior, right? There's ways to ask the questions, but respecting the curiosity. So, to sum up the first two things there, from the learning sciences, there's no such thing as variability, good or bad, without understanding context. You can't separate those two things, okay? You wanna know, you gotta know variability and how it interacts with a, a, an environment, your context, to know any outcome whatsoever.